Let's get to the exploded rocket okay. on the launch pad. Um, what one thing we've failed to do in the educational system is alert people that if you're doing what no one has done before, mm -hmm. stuff goes wrong. And in fact, if nothing ever goes wrong in what you're doing, if you make no mistakes in your job, in your in whatever task you've brought upon yourself, then you're not on the frontier. Simple. Mm -hmm. It, it's true in science, and I heard it applied to car racing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote that I'm, I'm told, spoken by Mario Andretti. He said, if you are in complete control of your car, you're not in the race. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's something that yeah. you're just not completely in control of. I take that. Take and that. only then can, and that's the same thing I'm describing mm -hmm. for when you are on the frontier. And SpaceX is on the frontier, not a space frontier where they're going farther mm -hmm. than NASA has gone. They're on another kind of a frontier, a frontier where they want to make access to space maximally affordable. So that means they have to design their rockets differently from how anybody else had done it before. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be mistakes. So I see the exploded, uh, explosion on the launch pad. And I say that is a, an occurrence that is rich with learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not just a spin. It's real. Yeah. And, and it's, yes, it's a spectacular explosion because the whole rocket is filled with fuel. But uh, it's typically one little thing that went wrong that they had not anticipated. They have to design it differently. Mm -hmm. Go back to the early days of NASA. This footage on YouTube. Yeah. Rockets blowing up all the time. Mm -hmm. Because no one had put rockets in space before. So now they're trying to do it in a whole new way. I'm, I'm going to expect that and more of it. Okay. Uh, if you look at our closest genetic relative to human beings, it would be the chimpanzee. We share like 98 plus percent identical DNA. We are smarter than a chimpanzee. So let's invent a measure of intelligence that make humans unique. Let's say intelligence is your ability to like compose poetry, symphonies, do art, math and science, let's say, okay? Let's make that as the arbitrary definition of intelligence for the moment. Chimps can't do any of that. Yet we share 98, 99% identical DNA, okay? The most brilliant chimp there ever was maybe can do a little bit of sign language. Well, our toddlers can do that. Toddlers. So here's what concerns me deeply, deeply. Everything that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. It has to, because that's the difference. The Hubble telescope, these grand, that's in that 1%. Maybe everything that we are that is not the chimp is not as smart compared to the chimp as we tell ourselves it is. Maybe the difference between constructing and launching a Hubble telescope and a chimp combining two finger motions as sign language, maybe that difference is not all that great. We tell ourselves it is, just the same way we label our books optical illusions. We tell ourselves it's a lot, maybe it's almost nothing. How would we decide that? Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Who, what are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. We would, they would take Stephen Hawking and roll him in front of their, their primate researchers and say, well, this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head. Oh, isn't that cute? Little Johnny can do that too. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, in fact, Johnny just did that. Let me get it. It's, it's, it's on the refrigerator door. Here he is. He did it in his elementary school class. Think about how smart they would be. Quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers. 
Whole symphonies would be written by their children and like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> so the notion that we're gonna find some intelligent life and have a conversation with it? <laughs> when was the last time you stopped to have a conversation with a worm? <laughs> or bird. Oh, well, you might have had a conversation, but I don't think you expected an answer, all right? <laughs> so, we don't have conversations with any other species on Earth with whom we have DNA in common. To believe that some intelligent other species is gonna be interested in us, enough to have a conversation? They'll look at our Hubble telescope and say, oh, isn't that quaint? Look at what they're doing. <laughs> so, I lay awake at nights wondering whether simply we as a species are simply too stupid to figure out the universe that we're investigating. And maybe we need some other species, 1%, 1% smarter than we are, for which strength theory would be intuitive, for which all the greatest mysteries of the universe, from dark matter, dark energy, the origins of life, and all the frontiers of our thought would be something that they would just self-intuit. I'm jealous of that possibility because I want to be around for those discoveries. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this. Key and Peele parodied me and my wife, uh, <laughs> not knowing that my wife has a PhD in mathematical physics. They did not know this. So Key and Peele are dressed up as me and as my wife. And my wife comes up to me and says, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you haven't taken out the garbage yet. And, and I stand there and I say, but in the multiverse theory, there could be a, a parallel universe in which I actually have taken out the garbage. So, and we don't know at all times by the quantum uncertainty principles which universe we might be in. So that in fact, this could be the universe in which I had taken out the garbage. And, and my wife goes, oh, wow, okay. So there's a series of these where he basically gets away with murder, yeah. right? But, but Cosmos is his way out of, the, out, of the, out of the responsibilities. And so people say, well, how do I feel? And I say, I, I don't feel, I don't invest emotion in what artists do. What I do is applaud the fact that there are artists of all kinds, musicians, actors, comedians, that have found the moving frontier of science as legitimate sources of their inspirational muse. And that, I think, is something to celebrate. If you go to the bookstore and look for books on gravity, there's maybe four or five on the shelf. Look for books on stars, there's maybe six. You look for books on consciousness, there's shelf after shelf after <laughs> shelf after shelf. That means we know nothing about it, okay? Because once you know, it's done, no more books are necessary, and you move on to the next problem. Don't be confused by the volume of what is written. The, the, the current discourse doesn't seem to care what is objectively true or not. People will want something to be true because it feels good, whether or not it is true. And the only way I can parody that is to comment that just because perhaps you gained a kilo of weight last week doesn't mean you can protest the law of gravity because it did not serve your needs. This is, doesn't work that way. So, so I, I worry that so much of what I do is not advancing people's understanding of their relationship to how the universe works, but it's just sort of holding on. Do you remember in the old days, the old variety shows, there'd be somebody who'd be spinning discs on long sticks? Do you remember this? And they would just run around, and if they were successful, it meant no plates fell. That was success, <laughs> but it was a constant effort, spinning plates. And so I don't know. I cannot speak with confidence. I can only say what level of energy I'm investing in this. And by the way, I think the press has to participate in, an, in a way that understands what we're saying. And I'll give an example. Often when there's a new discovery, especially in physics, 
the first line of the newspaper article will say, oh, scientists have to go back to the drawing board because their cherished theories are now challenged. As though we're sitting in our office with our legs up, not thinking, just basking in our mastery of the universe. No. You do, you, you do a bit of that, though, don't well, you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that image in my mind now of you no. there. <laughs> the Hayden Planetarium. No, and I've said this before, that there, there, there are, if you are an active research scientist, you are always at the drawing board, at the chalkboard. And, and you revel in a new idea that will challenge your idea. Because that means things are ready to move forward. That's mm -hmm. the most exciting time. Not some time we worry about. We might use the word worry, I, I worry, but at the end of the day, behind closed doors, it's the most exciting thing that can happen. And with the Higgs boson, the great search for that and ultimately discovered it by the Large Hadron Collider, it would have been almost as interesting if they had searched that same parameter space and didn't find the Higgs boson. Hmm. Then it's like, oh my gosh, all of this that requires that it be there has to be reassessed. Yes, people would go back to it, but they would do it gleefully. Because I don't give a rat's ass whether we share each other's opinion or not about anything. I don't care. And my Twitter stream has no opinions in it at all. I mean, if there's one, it's one in a hundred tweets will smack of some opinion of another. But that is not my MO. Most people with that platform are pundits who have strong opinions or, or they're, they, they're parts of movements and they want you to join that movement. You have never seen me debate people. You've never seen me at the front of movements holding up placards. You've never seen me arguing with politicians. It's not what I do. We had Benjamin Carson recently saying that, that well, not re I mean, it's in his, in his video log. It's that um, evolution is a fairy tale. Okay, and so this is a, not a particularly scientifically literate posture. Um, <laughs> and so, do I get angry with him? He is representing voters. In a free society, people can vote for whoever they want. If they want to vote for someone who thinks that evolution is a fairy tale, that is their right and it is their privilege. As an educator, I will alert the electorate that if you want to think that evolution is a fairy tale that has consequences to the economic health of the nation in which you live. Because innovations in science and technology are the engines of tomorrow's economy. If you want to accept it as your religion, that's fine. But you swap it into your science class, you are undermining the role that science plays. I, I just gave you information. It's an if then. If you do this, this will happen. It's not do this because I say so. Don't do anything because I say so. That's cult building. Hours a day to try to solve this and not you know just- You concern about Congress? Well, I, I, I check these numbers. 57% of Senate, 38% of the House cite law as their profession. And when you look at law, law is, well, what happens in the courtroom? It doesn't go to what's right. It goes to who argues best. And there's this urge there's the, whole, the entire profession is founded on who right. the best arguers are. Right. It's not a courtroom is not about the truth. It's about that they, that the theory. I, I, if I get what you're saying, is that everybody, are, each side, argues their version, and then the truth somehow emerges. That's the premise. However, the right. the, the practice, which, for example, is bred in debating teams, for example, where right. you know the subject, but you don't know what side you're going to put a, be put on to argue. Right. And so the act of arguing and not agreeing seems to be fundamental to that profession, and Congress is half that profession. And I, I, I realized this when I was a kid. I was 12, and I said, oh, I wonder what profession all these sen senators and Congress were. Law, 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 businessman, law, law. And I said, there are no scientists. We're the engineers. Where's the rest of life represented here? And so, so when I look at the conflicts, the argumentative conflicts, I just sit back and say, you know, can I buy an engineer, please? Or sign, put somebody, a, a, business, a, 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 a business person who knows how to make a hard but 
uh, but but uh, significant financial decision because at the end of the day they got to make their but their, their books work. One of the problems with science in schools is that we are taught science as subjects. There's history, science, English, Spanish. It's a subject. And then you learn stuff about that subject. But that's not really what science is. Science is a way of querying nature. There need to be classes on what science is and how and why it works. Then you are empowered. You are inoculated against throwing a snowball in Congress. If that's how you were trained to think about the natural world. But if science is just a satchel of facts, well, I choose these facts, those are your facts, I got my facts, and those are your facts. And the, the idea that you can interact with this information in a fundamental way and, ex and extract that what, which is bogus and that which is not doesn't seem to exist in the minds of people who have, and also, by the way, just to be clear, there is no shortage of people on the liberal left who are in denial of mainstream science just as you have them on the conservative right. The people who are anti-vaxxers are primarily left-leaning people. The people who are all into alternative medicine, which requires at some level that you reject mainstream medicine, are primarily people on the left. The people who are into odd, unusual, peculiar diets, they're people on the left. And so, the, now they're, so these are different issues, of course, but when I hear left people speaking of Republicans being anti-science, and I go down the list of things that are squarely in the, in the portfolio of left-leaning people, I, I offer no, I'm not choosing sides with you. But the ingredients of life as we know it match almost one for one the ingredients in the universe. For me, the most profound fact of my life. Go right on down the list. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Right on down to iron. They're also the most common ingredients in the universe. These heavy elements are traceable to the exploded remains of one or more massive stars that forged these elements in the core by the action of thermonuclear fusion. These stars then blew themselves to smithereens giving their lives to enrich the galaxy with the manufactured heavy elements from their core, enabling planets and people to form. Here we have a view of a supernova remnant in the constellation Vela, one of my favorite images of the cosmos. This ejected material will enrich gas clouds that will make solar systems. Yes, we are stardust. Carl Sagan used to say to me, it would be arrogant for us to believe that we are the only intelligent life in the entire universe. It'd be pig-headed, yeah, there's no... <laughs> yeah, I just, again, the sheer numbers that are involved, not only how many stars in the galaxy, how many galaxies there are in the universe, yeah. and as it is now becoming apparent that planets may be common around stars, for us to think we're the only life, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no way to... to to justify that given the sheer numerics of it. In addition, the chemistry of life, the carbon molecule, molecules, the, the carbon chemistry that drives life as we know it would be common everywhere in the universe because carbon is everywhere, everywhere we look. Yeah. So if we were made of bismuth or some unusual element, then we might have the right to assume that we're unusual. But we're made of the most common stuff in the universe. Your best guess that there is life of an intelligent form similar to us somewhere else in some other place. Yeah, I think it's, it's well... Likely? Probably? Uh, I, I'm, I'm riding the fence on that, because if you look at the history of life on Earth, by most definitions of intelligence, nearly all life that has ever existed on Earth has not been intelligent, yet it's been getting along just fine. So it doesn't appear that intelligence is a prerequisite to, to survive to, right. and to exist. And so I'm happy just looking for life at all, all right. whether or not it can do complex mathematics. Closer to the sun, has a thick, seething atmosphere checking in at 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not only hot enough to melt lead, but more important, it's hot enough to cook a large pepperoni pizza in nine seconds. The Venusian atmosphere is hostile, nearly 100 times the pressure of Earth's atmosphere. It's made primarily of carbon dioxide, upon which we can blame 
its runaway greenhouse effect. Mars was probably once a paradise, an oasis of running water, with an atmosphere dense enough to support it. No longer, it is bone dry. Only relic riverbeds and floodplains and silent river deltas remain. Yes, bad things happen to good planets. Mars and Venus may be the endpoints of climactic evolution gone awry. How do we prevent our cherished world from becoming another casualty in the solar system? By combining cosmic discovery with the Earth sciences,